Hey everybody, welcome back to Rightly Dividing with Pastor Rob. This is a series of biblical lectures. It's brought to you by the Burningville Baptist Church here in Burningville, Oklahoma. And our purpose is to bring contextual, clear, and entertaining Bible lessons, trying to make the Bible come alive, make them available to everyone. If you enjoy these videos, hey, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, share it, leave a comment. All of these things help these videos to be more readily available to others. And our purpose here is just to look and dig into God's Word. Let's see what God's Word actually says. So let's get ready to study together. So this is our series we're going through uh, on the wilderness journeys. And we I, I picked the most boring chapter in all the Bible, Numbers chapter 33. And I said, let's see if we can do a series out of this. And Numbers chapter 33 is just a list of places that the children of Israel traveled to on their journey between Israel and the promised land. And it's just they encamped here, they left here, they went somewhere else. And then we're looking at each of these places and seeing where they go and trying to get some type of uh, uh, semblance out of this. And so today we... Today we find ourselves arriving at Sinai, at Sinai. And so here in, in Numbers 33, it just says, hey, you know, we left Rephidim, we get to Sinai. Sinai is a very important place. There are three things that God gives to the children of Israel at Sinai. Here we have the beginnings of written testimony. And so the three things we're going to consider, and we're going to consider these in three different lessons, but the things that we see here, first, we have the Word of God. We have the men of God. We have the house of God. Now, I've said this, we have the, the tablets. What we think about is the Ten Commandments, but it's more than the Ten Commandments. The law is given here at Sinai. At Sinai, we see uh, uh, the entire book of Leviticus takes place here at Sinai. At Sinai, uh, the law is given. The laws are given. The Ten Commandments are given. And we're going to look at that in a lot more detail as we go along. Also, we see here at Sinai, God separating out the Levites to be the servants and the priests and the ministers and separating out men to help uh, uh, Abraham to, to do his things. And then the house of God, here God gives the instructions for his tabernacle. And at Sinai, the tabernacle is built, it is constructed. So from Sinai onward, the people, uh, as they go about this journey, they come into Sinai as a group of people that are Hebrews, they're descendants of Abraham, they have these stories that have been passed down uh, from Abraham, uh, through Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and, and through the generations, but they leave Sinai with God's word. They leave Sinai with something concrete that they can hold in their hands and say, this is what God wants. This is what God wants. They leave there with a place that they worship, the place where they go to meet with God. They leave Sinai with a, an entire tribe, one of the, an entire tribe out of the nation of Israel that has been set aside to handle the particulars of the worship of God. And so these three important things happen at Sinai. So going to Numbers chapter 33 and verse 15, this is all it tells us. It says, they departed from Rephidim and pitched in the wilderness of Sinai. So that's the extent that we see of it here. But we know that they were at Sinai for an extended period of time. If you just look at it, the, the last half of or the, the last portion of the book of of uh, Exodus, the entirety of the book of uh, Leviticus, 
in the first 10 chapters of the book of Numbers, all of that takes place at this place called Sinai. Now, I believe that this is my belief, and we've talked about this a little bit, that Sinai is not in Sinai, that the, or the Sinai Peninsula. I believe that Sinai is actually in Arabia, but that's neither here nor there. What's important is what they were given at Sinai. And so uh, to get here, to begin this lesson, I want to go back into the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 31. And uh, Moses goes up on the Sinai, he communes with God, and then it tells us this in Exodus chapter 31, verse 18. It says, He gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables or tablets of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. You see that last part there? Written with the finger of God. The word of God is the foundational thing that makes us who we are. In the Judeo-Christian uh, 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 worldview, and as people of God, as Christians, as members of a church, we need to understand that the Bible is preeminent. The Word of God is what God has given us that teaches us all kinds of things. And so we're going to look at what it is we get from the Word of God. The sad truth is today that most Christians don't know their Bible. I don't know how many Christians I've talked to that tell me they've never read the book of Numbers or the book of Leviticus. They don't know what's contained in these books. But these books in the, in the Torah, they are foundational to everything we believe. And the Bible should be our guide. It should be the pillar that we stand on. How can we say that we believe the Bible is God's Word and we believe the Bible if we don't know what the Bible says? And I think that it is very important for us to understand. And it tells us here, speaking of the Word of God, do you realize that the first part of the Bible <laughs> to be written down was actually and literally written by God? God. Think of that. You know, we think of the Bible as this book that was written by, uh, uh, you know, all these different uh, authors over a long period of time, and God inspired them to write. But the first <laughs> scripture to actually be written down was literally written by the finger of God. And you know what he said? And we see that, we're going to see it in, in Exodus chapter 20, but God begins by teaching us who He is. See, the Word of God teaches us who God is. And He begins His writing with this statement in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2, where He says, I am the Lord thy God. Now, we've mentioned this before, I'll bring it out again, but in the Old Testament, in your Bible, if you see L-O-R-D written in all caps, sometimes it's small capital letters, smaller than the L, but the L, the O, the R, and the D are in capital letters. This is the proper, this is a proper noun. This is the name of God. This is Yahweh or Jehovah, however you want to pronounce it. This is the name of God. He begins his writing by declaring who he is. I am Yahweh, your God. And this is foundational for us to understand that the word of God comes to us from God. He is the one that is in the position to dictate to us everything that we see. 
He begins with, in, in Exodus chapter 20 is where we find the Ten Commandments. He says, I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the first rule that God wrote down and told to Moses as he was communing with him. This is the foundational part. As we begin our work, we have to decide, who is my God? Am I my God? Or is, or is Jehovah, is Yahweh my God? Who is my God? And the first thing that God wrote was this sentence, I am the Lord thy God. The word of God teaches us who our God is, who he is. The second thing we see is that God teaches us how he desires to be worshipped. Think about this. The Bible teaches us, and it's not, we, we see this uh, uh, played out with dif different authors and different places and different ways of thinking about it, but these first things written down by the actual very literal finger of God on these tablets of stone, God begins by telling us who he is, what our relationship is to him, and then God tells us how he would be worshipped. This is an important part. This is something super important. Today in today's world, most Christians go about deciding how we want to worship God. I want to worship God in a way that is pleasing to me. I want to worship God in a way that makes me feel good. I want to worship God in a way that, that uplifts my spirit. I want to worship God in an environment that's, that, that's conducive to my well-being. But we decide how we want to worship God. I heard an old pastor say one time that uh, he, he uh, at the close of a service, one of the men came by and shook his head and, and said, Pastor, I just want you to know, I didn't, I didn't really get anything out of the worship today. I didn't really enjoy the worship service today. And the pastor looked at him and smiled and said, well, that's okay. We weren't worshiping you. You see, we want the worship experience to be about us. But see, God is the one who we are worshiping. Our worship is not designed to please us. Our worship should be designed to please God. And look at what God says. Uh, we know this. This is the second commandment, right? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And I don't, I'm not going to get into the argument here about whether we should worship on Saturday or Sunday, but the principle is here that God has set aside a time for us to worship. That means that there is a day of our week that we set aside for worshiping God. We have a day of the week that we say, this day is not about me. This day is not about fulfilling my lust. This day is not about me earning money. This day, this day is about worshiping God. He says, if you go on down here in Exodus 20, now this is after the first 10 commandments. This maybe you would call the 11th commandment. But he says, if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. And in verse 24, he says, in all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. These places where I record my name, the idea of a hewn stone. So think about this. God is telling us how he desires to be worshiped. One, he says, if you build me an altar, don't hew the stone. Why? He's saying, you know, a lot of times when we build our altars, we build them in ways that are aesthetically pleasing to us. 
instead of building a place that is conducive to the worship of Him. We build and design our churches today to be temples for us. But when we talk about uh, later, when we talk about the tabernacle and God gives Moses the plans for the tabernacle and the things he wants included later on when uh, he grants uh, David's desire and allows Solomon to actually build a permanent temple for him. Man, every detail is laid out. This is how I want my house built because I want it built in a way that I can reside there. I want the places where you worship to be directed towards me, not you. When I hew a stone, I look at a, a rock that God has created and I say, I can improve upon what God has done. And I can make this stone more pleasing to me. Instead of saying, you know, Lord, I want to worship you in a way that is pleasing to you. He tells us when to worship, how to worship. The Bible, as we go forward, it gets refined down and we learn about singing and we learn about our prayer life and we learn about all of these things, how we should worship God. But the principle that I want to set forward here today that God is establishing here at Mount Sinai is, is that God dictates our worship. Can you understand that? God dictates our worship. How incredibly vain it is for me to tell God how I want to worship him. For me to tell God how I want to serve him. For me to tell God how I want to do things for him. I'm not God. He is my God. So the word of God tells us who God is. The word of God teaches us then how to worship God. And then we move into the next part of the Ten Commandments. But I want you to know that the word of God teaches us how we should treat others. And the Word of God is such a foundational book. It just, it answers the questions. It comes in here and it tells us how we should treat others. We don't envy them. We don't covet their things. We don't kill them. We don't steal from them. We don't lie about them. We don't bear false witness towards our neighbors. The Bible begins to teach us how we relate to God, and it teaches us how we relate to the people that are around about us. This is in God's Word. So many times we treat the Bible as some archaic old thing and, you know, it needs to be a modernized, it needs to be updated, it's not relevant to our life today. We want to hear messages that are relevant to our life today, uh, uh, the, things like Bible study. You know, if we have a, a, a service that's a praise and worship service and we're going to worship in a way that's pleasing to people, then we can fill up a building. But if we say, you know what, today, this evening at six, we're going to study God's word and you open up the doors and nobody comes. Why? Because we're not interested in what God has to say to us. We are more interested in what we have to say to God. We are more interested in pleasing ourselves than we are with pleasing God. And I believe that is a shame. But this is, God wrote this part. You know, you talk about, well, who wrote this book? Who wrote that book? Well, I'll tell you what, these commandments here, the Bible tells us were written by the very finger of God. God tells us who he is. He tells us how to worship him. He tells us how we should interact and treat others that are around about us. The Word of God teaches us about family. It tells us, uh, the Word of God teaches us how to be a good father, how to be a good husband, how to be a good wife, how to be an obedient child, how we should treat uh, the members of our family, how we should bring up our children. The Bible teaches us all of these things. The Bible teaches us about work. It teaches us about the responsibility of being a good employer, being a good employee. 
The Bible teaches us about sin. And the Bible teaches us about mercy. The Word of God is the basis for our faith, for our practice, for our worship, for our daily lives, and it is a sad state of affairs that most Christians today are really biblically illiterate. We read the Bible by bouncing from the story to story to story that we know. It's like in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then it's blah, 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 Adam and Eve, blah, blah, blah. Well, Cain kills Abel, and blah, uh, Noah, Tower of Babel, and we move, we jump, even in our reading, we skim over large sections. We, uh, the, the genealogies and the lists, they bore us. But every part of God's Word is there for a reason to teach us something. So today, beginning this on Sinai, this is not going to be a long episode. I just wanted to point out that as the children of God came to this place at Sinai, the first thing that God decided that His people needed in order to to move on towards the promised land, the first thing that God gives them is His Word. You need this Word in order to serve me, in order to worship me, in order to understand who I am, in order to understand how to treat the people that are around you, in order to understand your own limitations and your own sin, in order to understand the mercy and grace that comes from God. All of these things, none of these things would we know without the Word of God. I would encourage you today to read through. We're coming up on uh, January 1st. Sunday is the first day of the year. I would encourage you to find you a Bible reading plan. Read your Bible all the way through, even the boring parts. I would encourage you to find a church that preaches the Bible. Not just a church that preaches uh, um, uh, motivationally, but a church that is based upon the truth of God's Word. And understand how foundational it is. If you're a Christian, and there are large parts of the Bible that you don't know and you don't understand, I would encourage you to read and to study. We're going to dig into this time at Sinai a little more in coming lessons. We're going to dig in. We're going to look at these verses. We're going to try to understand. But what I really want to sink home right now is that the first thing that God gave to his people at Sinai was his word. And that these words came directly from him. He is our God. He declares how we should worship him. He declares when we should worship him, where we should worship him. You hear so many people say, well, I don't need to go to church. I can worship God at home. Look, you should worship God everywhere you are. You know why we go to church? Because the Bible commands us to. Because God made the declaration that this is how he wanted to be worshipped. Was he gives him the word of God, as he gives them the men of God that would serve him and minister to the people, he gives them a place to come and worship him. It is so important for us to understand that we are not the arbiters of how we worship God and where we worship God. God is. God is. Do you want to worship God the way He would be worshipped? I'll tell you what, if you can get to the point in your spiritual life where you begin to worship God, not as you want to be worshipped, not as you enjoy worshipping, but if you worship him the way he has outlined in his word that he would be worshipped, then your worship will go a lot further. You'll get a lot more out of worship because worship is not about fulfilling us. Worship is about honoring the one who gave himself for us. 
So we are going to look into this as we go along. And I would just encourage you to think about the place of God's Word in your life. Where is your Bible? Is it sitting on a shelf somewhere gathering dust? Or do you just look up a verse when you want to read it on your phone? Or do you sit down daily opening God's Word, digging through it, learning it, studying it? Because it is, it's foundational. It's foundational to who we are in our relationship to Him. It's how we know what has happened, and it's how we know and understand what God is going to do. It's all right here in the Bible. And the beautiful thing about this is, is that God's Word is available for all of us. You can do it. You can read it. You can study it. You can see for yourself what God said. And that is so important. That is so important. Thank you so much for listening to this uh, uh, presentation today. Remember, if you are enjoying these videos, please hit like, subscribe, leave a comment. If you leave a comment, uh, it helps with the algorithm so that other people can see it. Uh, we, uh, uh, this is a ministry out of Bernieville Baptist Church. I'm not getting paid for this. Uh, I just want to put these out there, make them free and available to everyone. But if you like these videos, please like, subscribe, share, comment. This helps more people to be able to see these video presentations. Thank you so much, and God bless.